Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Wow, this is a super exciting day for us all at New Relic, and, and we're so um, thrilled to welcome you all to FutureStack 15. Um, this is our, our third conference, and uh, it's definitely going to be our best yet. And we're particularly excited to be hosting it here at this wonderful historic place, the Fairmont, home of my favorite bar in the world, You're, if you didn't have breakfast at the Tonga Room. I mean, where else can you find a bar with a pool in it that the band kind of comes out and it rains inside and you can have a $15 Mai Tai in, in, a, in a ceramic coconut cup? I mean, that's, that's just can't be replicated. Um, the, my only, my only um, request is uh, for next year is that I don't get stuck in an elevator for 20 minutes immediately prior to my keynote. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to the good folks of the Fairmont, they rallied and uh, here I am. You're stuck with me. I want to thank our sponsors uh, because, you know, we recognize that the mission we're on at New Relic is a noble mission, but it takes a partnership with lots of like-minded companies. What we all believe in is kind of expressed in the theme of that great video that just came on is that we're at an exciting time uh, because the world is changing through software and that it takes a, a collection of great companies as well as a collection of great people, the people in this room, to take software and change the world. Um, and so uh, get to know these companies that are sponsoring our conference um, and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy working with them as we do. So guess what this is? It's a safe harbor slide. This is the most exciting slide of the whole day. There's a reason why we have a safe harbor slide. It's because we went public last year. So uh, that was a big moment for us. And uh, it was a particularly big moment for the lady in the white next to me. That's my mom. <laughs> The head of the New York Stock Exchange said he never in all of the IPOs witness saw a lady in her 70s dancing like this on the stage quite so joyously. I think she's streaming right now, so uh, mom, thank you for uh, being part of that. Um, but we're now a public company, but it's really just a step along our journey, which we hope uh, and believe will go on for decades to come. Because we feel like um, we have uh, a very important part to play at a very important part in time. And, and I want to spend a couple minutes on where we are right now in the industry and why we're all at this uh, conference. You know, why are we here at FutureStack? Not necessarily why are we here philosophically, you know, on this planet. That's, that's a different conference um, of which I have very little expertise. But I do uh, have a sense of why we're all here. Um, and I can certainly share why I'm here at New Relic and why I'm here at FutureStack. It's because I believe in software and I love software. Here I am at my first job. Uh, this is in 1993. I'm fresh out of college and I'm working at this company some of you may have heard of. It's called Apple. And I'm in a joyful spot. I'm surrounded by computers and surrounded by code. I'm like living in my most, uh, you know, the, there's nowhere else I'd rather be at that time in my life. A um, couple of little details from this picture. Um, first of all, yes, it is true. At one point I did have hair. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see this in the corner, in the bottom corner, there's a little Ben and Jerry sticker, you can kind of see that. That's on my beer fridge that I brought over from college, and, and if you can see, my key ring actually has a little beer bottle opener, so I'm clearly in my early 20s and um, <clears throat> barely out of college, but what, it, what I loved about my job, what I loved about working at Apple, um, is what I've always loved about software. It was this incredible creative outlet. Um, my degree was in computer science, but I never thought of myself as a scientist. I always thought of myself as a creative person that used technical and scientific approaches to solve really hard creative problems. And that's why um, I get so much joy in software to this day, because it's we all get joy in whatever creative outlets we pursue. I just think the creative medium of software is the most powerful creative medium of our time, without question. And here's why. Um, first of all, there are no limits to what you can do in software. I mean, you're not constrained by the physical world. Um, the way you might be if your creative medium is, is say, if you're an artist and you're uh, working in, um, in clay, or if you're an architect and you're, 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 you're constrained by what you can do with steel. But there are very few constraints in what you can do with software, and that's why um, so many magical things are happening in software today. 
But then the second factor is where we are in time and how software gets distributed. And to kind of get you thinking about how software reaches people, let's look at how it got distributed back when I was, had a beer fridge and a bottle opener on my key ring. We put software on disks and we shipped them across the world to people. In fact, that's where we came up with the term shipping software. We still use that term today, shipping software. Well, that's because back in the 90s, it literally went on a ship and it went to a remote place where somebody might put a disk in a computer and they might install the software and they might use it and they might have a good or a bad experience. All of those mights, all of those what the customer did is completely invisible to the authors of the software. You have no connection between the builders of the software, even the distributors of the software, and the people who use the software. And of course, how can you expect to really understand your customer and how good your software is if you don't have that connection? Now that changed dramatically, and the world changed dramatically with the advent of the internet. All of a sudden, I can reach the world if I put that software idea on some servers, and those servers are hosted on the public internet. And that's a wonderful thing, because now I can suddenly have global reach with, 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 this, with this distribution phenomenon. And that's, I think, at the core of why the internet changed the world, is that we've taken out the intermedium of, of distribution between software and the consumer. But the problem with that was all the friction. A data center doesn't build itself. There's a ton of friction between building your software and getting it onto the internet. Um, in, in first generation internet technologies. And that all changed dramatically with the advent of cloud. Now there's no friction between reaching people in the cloud and better yet, with mobile, you're not reaching tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of millions of people, you're reaching billions of people. So that's why in 2015, software is the most powerful creative medium of our time. Because someone with an idea has very little friction between that idea turning into a piece of software that can reach billions of people and have a global impact. And that's pretty exciting. And that's why I feel like there's so much emphasis and some, so why all the great companies in the world are thinking about how can we use software to change the world. It's because of the limitless potential of this creative medium. But it's not this unidirectional thing anymore. You know, it's not that one person has this idea or a group of people has this idea and they just push it out in one way. You need a bi-directional communication with your customers. Think about, for the example of Facebook. Facebook was a great idea when Mark Zuckerberg was in his dorm at Harvard. Um, but if it was just that idea as is, Facebook wouldn't be the, the company it is today. What Facebook got really good at was measuring everything that the customers were doing in that software, taking those measures in real time to make better decisions on what to build next. So it's this feedback loop between understanding what your customers are doing, Obviously, are they having a good experience? And then using that data to make the software better on a never-ending basis. That's at the core of what we do at New Relic, is help you with that mindset. If you're not measuring what your customers are doing with your software, you're not connected to your software. You're not connected to your customer. And your software won't succeed. And there are particular moments where you can't resist watching what your customers are doing with your software. In particular, there's the excitement of launch day. How many people have kind of participated in a day where you're launching a new piece of functionality and, and like, it's a very exciting moment, right? It's when like all of your hard work is now shown to the world. And that's, that's, that's just a very special moment. I, I've had many of those. And um, I got to see in real time in Twitter, you know, and, and kind of empathize with someone going through that very exciting moment um, through, through a stream of tweets. So this guy, his name is Mike Hostetler. Um, is with a startup that managed to get itself on Shark Tank. How many people have heard of Shark Tank? Oh, you all have, of course. It's this nationally televised show. What a great opportunity for, an, for a company to get exposure on a national stage. So that's what happened with this guy's startup. The startup's called Rent Like a Champion, and the shorthand of what it does is it's kind of like Airbnb, but for specifically for big game football game days in college towns. So if you're if you've got a huge football team in a small college town, you know, there may be eight or 10 weekends a year where your town gets flooded with people who need a place to stay. And they help solve that problem on a national scale. Pretty good idea. In fact, good enough to get, you know, get a bid from, from the folks at Shark Tank. So while that's going on on TV, 
Mike is staring at how it, what's going to happen on our web property, because this is a web business. And you could just see in real time. He can't help but tweet. More people are coming on. The site's holding up. We're still climbing. 8,000 users, 100% uptime. New Relic is there with me. It's kind of like, imagine that launch day without being able to see the site. You feel like, you know, that you've completely lost. It's like, you know, not being there for the birth of your child, right? You want to be there in those moments when something really important happens. And the fact of the matter is, if you're an agile development shop, if you feel like you must constantly improve your software, then every day is launch day. Every day is a day where you need to be watching what your customers are doing with your software so that you can make the software better. And that's where we come in. You know, not only for Rent Like a Champion, but for some of the greatest companies in the world of all stages. We've got Nordstrom Rack and News Corp here as examples of websites that New Relic uh, and digital properties and, and mobile properties that New Relic monitors and, and watches on real time. So while consumers are looking at stuff like this, our customers are looking at stuff like this to make sure everything's working well. And in particular, they're focused on three very important interconnected things three very important interconnected things that heretofore have been disconnected. Success involves application performance. Is the software healthy? Is it working? Are there bugs? Is it fast consistently? It involves a great customer experience. Can you measure that customers are having a good experience with your software? And the third is, what is the business performance of the software? If you're an e-commerce site, how many items are you selling? If you rent like a champion, how many people are looking at and booking you know, overnight stays? All of these things, three things are interconnected. And let's talk a bit about how we got here and why we think they're interconnected. In order to do that, I want to take you back in history. Again, back in the 90s, back when the software was going out on disks, back when the earth cooled. People monitored servers. People monitored servers, and, and at, by the mid-90s, it became basically standard operating procedure. Don't put any server in production without putting on something on the server to watch it. That made a lot of sense. Why wouldn't you have something to watch the health of the server? But like many things in life, after you've been doing something for so long um, that becomes standard operating procedure, you often forget the reason why you did it in the first place. Why are people watching all these servers anyway? Well, the only reason why you have servers running in production is to run software. The real reason why you watch servers is because you, it's a proxy for the software. Well, along came this new kind of software called application performance management. I actually created that with a few friends that are at New Relic. A few of them are in the room. We've been doing this since uh, 1998, where we said, look, the whole point is the application. You know, you buy the hardware, you run the hardware to run the software. So that's the real end game, isn't it? Well, actually, it isn't. Why do you care about application performance? Why do you care about application health? Well, at the end of the day, it's all about is the customer having a good experience? It's not how many errors per minute, it's how many customers are having errors. And what's the impact on the customer experience as to whether or not they're coming back? And tying that all the way through to the health of the application and the server is super important because what's causing the error may be infrastructure related or may be application related. So that's the end game, right? It's all about measuring the customer experience. Well, not quite. Because the whole reason why we build this software and we try to deliver a great customer experience is for a business outcome. Again, in the e-commerce example, the whole point for a great customer experience is selling more stuff online. In the case of Rent Like a Champion, it's um, getting more people to book more rooms so they can collect their fee for their value add. And that goes on for every digital project that you're in. If you're in marketing, you want more impressions on people that gets people into your funnel engaged with your brand. The problem is that most companies didn't measure all of these things until very recently. In fact, many companies still don't measure all of these things. And until today, for those of you who do measure all these things, you're using different tools from different vendors. And that creates silos. So you have folks saying, sales are down. I can see that from a report from last week. 
And there's no connection to the fact that that's related to an application performance problem or a server change or a customer experience issue. We think that has to stop. We think all this data belongs in one platform. And that drives our corporate strategy and our product strategy. And more importantly, the only way, the only way to do this is in the cloud. The only way to do this is in the cloud. Why do I say that? Well, because it really is centered around the enormity of the data that must be collected in order to adequately solve this problem. This is an enormous big data problem, an enormous big data problem. And I want to go into some technology to explain why this is a big data problem and how hard a data problem it is to solve. And when I talk to New Relic customers and the builders of great digital software, you have very full plate. You have an awful lot you're trying to do, just trying to build, build a great customer experience, build a great software, and keep it running. Do you really want to also tackle the enormity of the problem I'm about to describe with an on-premise solution? Let's look at the example of an e-commerce website that might have an oversimplified architecture that looks like this. I've got a mobile app on the client that when somebody presses a button, maybe purchases an item on my shop. So let's say Bob walks up to his mobile phone, <laughs> picks up his mobile phone, and runs a transaction through. And everything will go smoothly, and Bob is happy, and he's bought his sweater. Things are good. But at the same time, Hillary logs in, tries to buy something, and the database is slow. Hillary's not happy. We don't like it when Hillary isn't happy. <laughs> now, in the previous generation technologies before the cloud, the only rational way you could try to measure all this was to sample or to index or to throw away or to aggregate data. You couldn't capture everything all the time. It was just too much data to collect on-premise. Certainly too much data to query in real time on-premise in an arbitrary fashion. So what did previous generation tools do? They aggregated. And you lost sight of your customer. And when Hillary says, I couldn't buy a thing online, you say, well, 0.9 seconds was the average time. And maybe we have a max that says somebody had a 1.3 second time, but we didn't collect all the individual data points um, to answer that question because it was just too much, too much until today. Because it's not just, you, you, the easy part might be, well, hey, I can imagine collecting one row, one row into a very big database for every transaction that goes through. But that's, it's not one data point for each of those transactions. If you want to de-aggregate all of this, you need to collect all the data points for everything that happened in there, right? So like that one page load might trigger 10, 50, 100 events. And if you want to know that Hillary couldn't buy that item because of a database problem, following all those data points, you need to collect it all. You need to collect it all. That is an enormous amount of data. Imagine every HTTP request that goes to the front end of your site generating 10, 15 rows that you want to arbitrarily query in real time all the time. That amount of data dwarfs the amount of data that's in your application. It dwarfs the amount of data in your application, and it grows every day, every second. If you have anybody using your software, data should be collected about exactly how they're using it and how all the infrastructure behind it works together. This is not an easy problem to solve, but some folks have tried to solve it in what we would call arcane, expensive, and inadequate ways. You could try to build a big data solution on premise to collect all that data and then index, index that data in a way that anticipates what the questions might be ahead of time. Everybody has familiarity with indexing and how that works with databases, right? It's a way to say, look, if I ask a question of the data that, that sh shows me who are the slowest response times by username, well, I need to index on response time and username to get that answer quickly. If I don't, then I run what's called a table scan, where I scan all the rows in the database, and things melt, and the lights dim. And, 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 and if it's a production database, 
you might actually impact production. You might even take it down, right? So you put in indexes, and you get quick answers when you've write, written the right indexes. Imagine how much time it takes just to build and manage that kind of database. If you decided to do it today, even if you're using great cloud technologies, you're months away from having this really working to the way you want it. And then if you're lucky and you hit the query, you're going to get a fast answer until a new question comes along that says, well, I want to break it out by gender, or I want to break it out by age, or I want to break it out by sign up date. Oh, I didn't put an index for that. Um, it's OK. I've only got a 3 trillion row database I can put an index in. Can I get back to you in two weeks? <laughs> says, oh, I didn't want gender after all. I wanted something else, right? So that loses flexibility. It's a very inflexible solution. And the only way you can be successful in business is to be able to ask lots of questions, right? Asking questions and getting immediate answers, that feeds the next question. It's that feedback loop, that iterative feedback loop of question and answer of your software that enables you to have insights and solve problems. When you lose flexibility, you lose that ability to do that. You get rigid in your thinking, and you lose control, or you lose your opportunity to differentiate. This ain't cheap. This ain't cheap to build. It's a lot of hardware you got to manage, a lot of instances you need to run if you're using cloud. And it's all in service of measuring the software. It's all taking away from your time and energy on what you should be doing, which is building awesome software that your customers love to use. But there's an even more expensive way to do it. <laughs> Brute force. What if you built a super cluster that was an enormous, gigantic build that basically said, I'm not going to worry about indexes. I can't presuppose what the questions are, so I'm just going to try to, anytime somebody asks a question, brute force my way through the data as fast as possible. And if you spend enough money, maybe you can scan a billion rows in a second. Has to be a lot of money. Has to be a huge cluster. Cluster F, maybe, but we'll just say it has to be a huge cluster. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Um, <laughs> You get flexibility at great cost, enormous cost. We think there's a better way. We actually solve this problem for all of you. And we do it with a proprietary database we built from the ground up that nobody else has and nobody else has done. Because it's pur purpose built for this problem. It's a database called NRDB. It's a multi-tenant cloud analytics database. This is the database that fuels the engine that is New Relic Insights. OK? And what's special about it, I looked at all the other databases. I, I think some of you have heard this story. Um, I spent most of 2012 trying to solve the above problems, uh, you know, the whole how do we get closer to the customer. And I ran into walls with the, in, the other technologies. Either um, we needed to index on everything because we couldn't presuppose what our qu customer's question were. Um, or we needed to build an enormous supercluster for every customer, because all the existing open source database technologies were never designed to be hosted in a multi-tenant environment. And they weren't really designed with SaaS in mind. These are databases that are intended to be run in, um, in traditional environments, not as a database as a service. But that's what we've built, and it's unique. And, and I'm going to go into the multi-tenant nature of it in a second, because that's the real key thing you need to understand is why this is so hard or, well, beyond expensive to do if you're to do it on-premise with your own stuff. You know, we've built this super cluster so you don't have to. And right now, it's collecting over 2 million events every second. That's the insert rate into our cloud database, 2 million events per second. And at trade shows like this, People throw out big numbers, and it's really hard to get a sense, well, how, how do I kind of map that in the universe of how much is 2 million events per second? So here's some context for you to kind of understand. Every day, here are the event insert rates of the top social media companies. So we see Instagram posts 80 million events per day. Half a billion tweets are, 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 are issued every day, and WhatsApp at 700 million images shared every day. And, if you were here at last year's Future Stack, you may have noticed we actually put all of the tweets in real time into Insights 
as one of the many tenants in our multi-tenant cluster, and it was a non-event for us. We were able to do real-time analytics on every tweet in existence in real time. That's the level of processing power we do, because by comparison to this many events per day, New Relic is collecting 18 billion events every day. 18 billion events every day. So if, um, if you're not Google, <laughs> um, then you should be just fine inside NRDB for all of your web properties. And maybe Google, I don't know. Let's just say if you're not Google. Keep my lawyers happy. All right, <laughs> that's the right activity. That's the right activity. But this isn't data that's going into cold storage for you know, weekly reports that are indexed. Um, that's the old way of thinking about it. You need to be flexible. You need to be able to query this all in real time. So when we do run a query, it is a lightning fast table scan. And we're scanning 126 trillion events every day. 126 trillion events every day. And to kind of just give you a sense of the power of NRDB, I just want to, let's just go to a demo. I, I, just, I decided I'd do this last minute. So can we just flip over to a demo for fun? So this is a dashboard that shows New Relic Insights reporting on NRDB itself. And um, I should decide to see how we're doing. This is literally real time, so it was like I was taking risk. Hopefully we don't have a hiccup right now. And we're not having a hiccup because this thing just chugs right along. So when I said 2 million events per second, I was definitely undershooting. It's 2.5 million events per second. It's inserting right now. And the average query Going through that database is a 20 millisecond query. 99% of our queries are at 221 milliseconds, and they're all table scans. That's mind blowing. And in aggregate, they're looking at 800 million events per second right now. Earlier this morning, I was seeing that three or four billion events per second, and the 99th percentile query time doesn't move. So that is kind of what's chugging along for all of our customers right now, enabling you to really understand what's going on in your software and in your business. Uh, we don't think there's a database remotely like this, um, certainly in the cloud. And we think um, that's a, a foundational technology that you want to understand how it works because it's going to impact how you think about watching your software and measuring your software. So if we go back from the demo, we can show how on earth is this possible? How on earth is this possible? So the way it works is we've built this enormous supercluster. Really, really large number of machines that would be it's too expensive to conceive of to build for any single customer. But for any one of our customers, like Rent Like a Champion, when their data goes into NRDB, it's parceled up into all of the servers in our cluster. And there's duplication of that data, so if one of the servers goes down and things like that, so it's, there's lots of things we do to ensure resiliency of, and, and performance. But these are big, beefy servers with lots of RAM, so that when someone from Rent Like a Champion writes a query, that data is already going to be in memory, and you can do a lightning fast table scan that spans the entire database. So if you ask, what are the most popular universities that people are looking at right now at Rent Like a Champion? Because we want to make sure there's enough supply rooms at the towns that people want to go stay at. That's an important real-time question. You don't want to ask that a week later. You want to know that right now, early in the week, right? So you run that query. and. NRDB does an awful lot of magic super fast and comes back in 43 milliseconds and says, I've looked at all the page view events, and the most popular university is Notre Dame. And because you get that in real time, your mind is in a place where you can creatively solve the problem and say, ah, you know what? Our whole QA team went to Notre Dame. I have a feeling this is actually not quite the right question. I think I've got bad data because I didn't ask the right question. Um, because there's probably a bunch of test data that is going on in production that always returns Notre Dame. So can I just put something in the where clause or say not test equals true? And all of a sudden, in, in, in the old world, that, oh, geez, you're, you're all of a sudden you're hitting a, a, a column that we don't index on, and, and that could melt the database. No problem for NRDB. We just scan all the events again, and we get the answer right away. There it goes. Too many clicks. All right. So that's super powerful. And again, if it was just for one customer, well, you'd be spending millions or more 
just on managing this database, right? Um, and, and, but it's not just for one customer because meanwhile, someone at News Corp may be asking questions about what's going on in the Wall Street Journal right now. And so they can ask, how many article readers are there out there? What are the most popular articles? And how many of them are converting into subscribers? The only, only way this can be cost effectively done is with multi-tenant. Doing it with single tenant is kind of like buying an entire 747 because you fly across the country three times a year. It's just catastrophically expensive to do and maintain, and it makes no sense. But when you see all this data coming into our data analytics cloud, it's super important for us to talk about our focus on securing that data for you. We're all in on SaaS, and that means we have to have, and we do have world-class security. We spend an enormous amount of time and energy making sure that the data that goes into NRDB is secure, only accessible to you, never visible to any other New Relic customer. And really what it comes down to is a team of experts that are fully dedicated to the security function in New Relic. We currently have seven people on the security team. They're led by a guy by the name of Sean Gordon. Sean, uh, Sean's previous job was being accountable for the security of all the tax data on TurboTax.com. Again, another cloud solution that had very sensitive data that, that, that TurboTax was, had to be you know, responsible for securing that, and he did a wonderful job with that. And now he leads a dedicated team that spends all their time with our engineers and our operations people making sure we do a world-class job of securing all this data. We're the only, the only software analytics vendor with SOC 2 compliance. We're the only one. Because we treat it so seriously. Because we're not saying SaaS is some checkbox while we do have other on-premise offerings. We're all in on SaaS. This is the core of what we do. So we can put all the stickers and labels of compliance, but it really comes down to the people that we have and how we focus them on securing your data. But if you think about it, what we've done is we've described a new way of doing things that we think is essential to making your software succeed. The old way of doing it involved delayed reports. You know, you might ask, in lucky, you know, you'd be lucky if you got an answer in an hour on some of these reports, these BI things that would churn away. And you have a very structured schema. You have to think in advance, what am I going to store and how am I going to organize that data? And sometimes you would try, in order to try to get things to be a little less slow, you'd lose some data, you'd sample or you'd aggregate the data. And you try to wrestle with all of this on-premise, and we feel like that's, that is no longer relevant or satisfactory. And particularly the unstructured data. So in the case of um, New Relic, you can, you can just decide today, I'm going to add an extra attribute to all these events we're, we're collecting. I want to you know, add the item name. And any, when someone browses something on the e-commerce store, item name comes into that, that event. And it's already there in the database, we don't need to change anything, and you can query it just as fast as you can query all the other things. That flexibility is super important. You don't have time to be managing databases um, for, for your software analytics. So that's all really powerful stuff, and I think with that framework, you now have an understanding of why what we offer is so powerful for all of you if you're thinking about application health, customer experience, and business outcome. And so let's just I distill this down into what this means for all of you. Well, New Relic has offered a large number of products um, to you. And, and I've talked a lot about NRDB. That's really the database behind Insights. But we have all these other products that many of you um, use. In fact, how many people are APM customers? Probably almost all of you, right? That's our flagship product. So what we have decided to do and built is building NRDB into all of our products. And so we are now enabling you to do big data analytics in APM, in browser, in all of the New Relic products. We call it analytics everywhere. Because we believe you can't rely on aggregates if you're going to understand your customer. You can't rely on aggregates if, you're, if you can't really get a handle on what's going on in production. 